بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا الدواوين we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to teach us beneficial knowledge so welcome to everybody on this salah course and uh, this basics of the salah though it's a basic course it's going to be fairly thorough and uh, before we start just to remind ourselves with some virtues pertaining to seeking knowledge so in the hadith the prophet sallallahu mentioned in bukhari and muslim a hadith collected by imam bukhari and imam muslim the prophet sallallahu said man yuridillahu bihi khair yufaqihu fi din that whomsoever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give good to he gives them understanding of the religion so it's clearly understood from the hadith that from the best of provisions that you can be given in this life is an understanding of the religion an understanding of how to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the quran in surah al-mujadila yarfa'illahu alladhina amanu minkum walladhina utu al-ilma darajat that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he raises those of you that have faith and further to that those of you that have been given knowledge many levels so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises the people of knowledge in this life before the next life so seeking knowledge is something which is virtuous and it's something which is so important because without knowledge we won't know how to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge we won't know how to draw close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge we won't have our checks and balances in the places that they should be uh, when we worship allah as well but it's imperative before we embark upon any journey in seeking knowledge that we always remind ourselves that whatever struggle we're going to go through in terms of seeking knowledge that we have to ensure that we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because if it's not for the sake of Allah azawajal if it's for showing off if it's for gaining fame if it's for trying to get into debates with people and to show how intelligent you are to show how much knowledge you have gained all of this will be a waste for you in this world and also in the next world because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the famous hadith in bukhari and muslim innama al-a'mal bin niyat wa innama li kulli imrin ma nawa that every person is going to be rewarded according to what they intended and you will get that which you intended as a reward so if you intended a worldly gain from acquiring knowledge then that's all you're going to get you're going to get something in the world maybe the praise of the people but that will do you nothing because the people can't benefit you in this life or the next all benefit lies in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's imperative that we always try to correct our intentions daily if not momentarily when doing acts of worship especially when seeking knowledge and one of the great imams of ahlu sunnah one of the great imams of islam is uh, imam ibn qayyim al jawzi in his book madarij salikin he gave a definition a beautiful definition of what sincerity is he said al ikhlas alla tatlub ala amalika shahidan ghayr allah wala mujaziyan siwahu he said that sincerity is that you do not seek a witness for your actions other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nor do you seek anybody to reward you for your actions apart from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in your heart you don't care who is listening to you you don't care who's watching you you don't care how many likes you may get in the future or how many dislikes you may get the only important thing to you is knowing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you and knowing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is going to reward you for your actions so with this in mind we start with the permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our course so the book that i've chosen to take the chapters of salah the chapters of prayer from is a book known as umdatul fiqh umdatul fiqh so that is the text that you have access to and this book is written by the great imam of islam the shaykh al islam ibn qudama al maqdisi muwaffaqadin abu muhammad ibn qudama al maqdisi muwaffaqadin abu muhammad he was born in the year 541 the islamic year and he died in the islamic year 620 after hijra he's a well known imam of ahl sunnah he's a very famous imam and he's a pillar of the hanbali madhhab he's a specialist in fiqh fiqh being the topic that we are studying how to worship allah how to know the rules and regulations pertaining to different acts of worship so he's a well known imam in this field as well as many other sciences in islam 
Um, one of the well-known scholars in Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi, he said about our author, Ibn Qudama, he said about him, ma dakhla sham ba'd al-awza'i afqahu min shaykh Ibn Qudama. That nobody entered into the lands of Sham, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, etc. More knowledgeable after Imam Awza'i, more knowledgeable than Ibn Qudama, our author. So it's a way of understanding his status because everybody knows that Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, is a great Imam in Islam. And for someone like to him to give a testimony and a witness about our author, it shows how great this Imam is whom we're going to take our fiqh of salah from. So this book, Umtut al-Fiqh, that we're studying, it's a first in a series of four books that this author, he wrote. So he was maybe one of the first people that wrote a curriculum of academic study. And his academic curriculum was pertaining to the fiqh, the rules and regulations of how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he wrote a beginner's book, which is the book that we are taking, Umdut al-Fiqh. And he has another three after that. If you were to complete all three of them after the one we're taking, you would be a very well-grounded expert in fiqh. So points of importance for us in the beginning of our journey is to understand that when we study fiqh, as it was well understood by our author and many other imams uh, of the sunnah and imams of knowledge, they understood that it's imperative that you take knowledge bit by bit and you don't rush. It's imperative that you understand the framework of the knowledge that you are trying to study and not delve too much into details because you will be lost. So in this journey of understanding what we're going to take in the fiqh of salah, the first important thing for everyone to pay attention to is the text. I'm going to explain the text as thoroughly as I can and that is the first point of learning that you need to be aware of and you need to focus on. You need to ensure that you can understand what the author is intending and the explanation that I have given to you. Thereafter, a second level above that would be for you to understand some of the evidences that we mentioned from the Quran on the Sunnah. And the third level would be for you to start to memorize the text and the evidences that I mentioned. But the imperative level, the most important level, as I mentioned, is the first one, that you do understand the text of the Imam. And if you are unable to comprehend the evidences or memorize the evidences or comprehend further information that I give, like examples and other statements, then that's not a problem. The most important thing for us, for us at this level is to comprehend the text of the Imam and to memorize whatever is possible from that. So going step by step is something which is very important in our journey of learning knowledge. Uh, the recordings will be available, so you can always refer back to the recordings, inshallah, if you need to um, you know, check what was mentioned, take more detailed notes, etc. So many people, they fall into the pitfall, they fall into a mistake, a major mistake. When they study, they try to acquire knowledge uh, too quickly, and they don't allow for that knowledge to settle in their minds and in their hearts. So they don't take it step by step, and they end up actually being like clowns, because what happens is, that they haven't understood the fundamentals of the knowledge, they've uh, dived and delved straight into major matters, and they haven't understood those either. So when they speak about Islamic knowledge, when they speak about fiqh, uh, the salah or other acts of worship, they make themselves look very silly because they don't have the Islamic etiquette, they don't have the academic approach which should be there, and they do not reflect the Islamic heritage of the scholars that have written on these topics because they rushed through and they didn't fully understand the fundamentals. Man hurim al usul, faqad hurim al wasul, as the as the scholars they say. Whoever is for, forbidden from understanding the fundamentals, then he or she will be forbidden from reaching the objective. So without the fundamentals, you cannot build upon that. And also the ulama they said, man rama ilm jumlatan dhahba anhu jumlatan. Whoever seeks knowledge in one go, then his knowledge will leave him in one go because he hasn't been or she hasn't been able to absorb the knowledge or understand the knowledge properly and build upon it as they should have. So the author, he starts and he says, Kitab as-Salah. Kitab as-Salah. The word Kitab, which is translated as book, of course it means book, but it has a technical meaning. It has a linguistic meaning, which uh, we just want to touch upon. Kitab comes from the word takattaba and it has the meaning of katiba. Okay, like we'd say in Arabic, katibutul jaysh. Katibutul jaysh is a gathering of soldiers. 
you would say it's a unit of soldiers wherein a group of soldiers have gathered to fight alongside one another. So kitab, linguistically, has a meaning of gathering. So the book is a gathering of ideas and information pertaining to salah. So that is the first word, kitab. The second word the author mentions here is as-salah, kitab as-salah. As-salah is a topic that we are going to be studying, salah, the prayer. So linguistically, the meaning of the word salah, it has reference to dua. And we know that dua is calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making invocations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the evidence for this is in Surah Tawbah in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salli alayhim. Salli, related to the word salah. Salli, make salah upon the believers. For verily your salah is a tranquility for them. So the meaning of the word salah in this verse in Surah Tawbah is dua. So the linguistic meaning of the word salah is dua. And in fact, it relates to the technical meaning also because most of the salah, most of the prayer is comprised of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different places in the salah. Like for example, Surah Al-Fatiha. If you look at the Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, which everybody has to recite in the salah, you'll come to know that the majority of it is a dua. You are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance and protection from misguidance and you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his blessings upon you. So the linguistic meaning of the word salah is dua. Now the technical definition, the definition in the sharia, or they say istilahan, istilahan meaning the technical sharia definition, is as follows. Ibadatun datu aqwalin wa af'alin muftatahatun bi takbir wa muhtatamatun bi taslim. It is an act of worship, okay, compromising of actions and statements, which starts with the first takbir, the opening takbir, and it finishes with the taslim, which is to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So it is an act of worship which comprises of statements and actions, and it starts with the opening takbir, and it is completed with the taslim. The author, he goes on and he quotes a hadith, he mentions the hadith which is collected by Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad and Imam Abi Dawood and others. The hadith is as follows. Rawa Ubadah ibn Samit radiyallahu anhu. Ubadah ibn Samit, this companion of the Prophet sallallahu sallam, he narrated as follows. He said, Samaitu Rasulullah sallallahu sallam yaqul. He said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam say, khamsu salawatin katabahunna that there are five daily prayers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made obligatory upon his servants during the day and during the night. Five daily prayers. So whoever preserves these five daily prayers as they should be preserved, then with him, between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is an agreement, a contract, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter him into Jannah. وَمَنْ لَمْ يُحَافِذَ عَلَيْهِنَّ فَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَهْدٌ إِنْ شَاءَ عَذَّبَهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ غَفَرَ لَهُ And whomsoever doesn't preserve these five daily prayers as they should be preserved, then this person doesn't have that promise from Allah Azza wa Jal, doesn't have that binding contract. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes, Allah will punish that person or Allah will forgive that person. So the author, Imam Ibn Qudama al-Maqtasi, may Allah have mercy upon him, he brought about this hadith as an evidence, as a proof to show us the importance of the five daily prayers. That without the five daily prayers being performed in the best of the manner that they can be formed, we don't have a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can enter into Jannah. It could well be the case if Allah so wishes that he prevents us from entering into Jannah for not having fulfilled the prayer in the way that we should have fulfilled it and not having paid enough attention to the prayer. And we'll come to know as we go step by step and as we practice the prayer that the prayer in reality is not just a key for us into, to enter into Jannah. Rather, it's a key for us to experience all forms of joy in this world. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily successful are those believers who have tranquility in their prayer. 
So when you pray to Allah and you learn to develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator and the controller of all that exists, and you learn to have tranquility in your prayer and you seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your prayer, you will start to enjoy life more and more. Your, your most enjoyable moments will be in the prayer itself because you've learned how to worship Allah properly and your heart and your soul will always be longing to be in the positions of the prayer. And when you leave the prayer, the virtue of that prayer will translate into the rest of the actions of your worldly life. They will bless your worldly life and they will give you contentment and enjoyment. So the author, he moves on and he says, فَالصَّلَوَاتُ الْخَمْسِ وَاجِبَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ he says the five daily prayers are wajib upon every Muslim. This word wajib, it means the same as another word you may have heard, which is fard. It means that which is obligatory upon you to do. So the scholars, they give a technical definition of this. They say, uh, uh, the scholars they say that this wajib it means that the one who does it out of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the commands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then this person is going to be rewarded and the one who leaves off this action then he deserves to be punished so that is the definition of a wajib that if you do this action out of submission to Allah and following the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then you are going to be rewarded However, if you leave off this action, which is wajib or fard, then you deserve to be punished. If Allah wishes, He will punish you. If Allah wishes, He will forgive you. So it's something which is obligatory. So again, the author, he said, فَصَلَوَاتُ الْخَمْسِ وَاجِبَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمِ That the five daily prayers, they are obligatory upon every Muslim. So the point that the author mentions here about being a Muslim shows us that it's not going to be accepted from somebody who is not uh, who is a non-Muslim because that person doesn't have the belief that it is required for acts of worship to be accepted the person doesn't have the Tawheed nor can the person make an intention to do an act of worship because they haven't accepted Islam so until a person is a Muslim the acts of worship are not going to be accepted from them and also when a person has left disbelief and come to Islam then all of those prayers that they missed whilst they were non-Muslim, they don't have to make them up. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His mercy and His gift to the one who became a Muslim, all those bad deeds that the person did and all those actions that they didn't do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them as rewards in their scale on the Day of Judgment, inshaAllah. The author, the next statement he says, he's mentioning now, so he spoke about that there's five daily prayers which are obligatory, which we must perform upon the Muslim. So he's mentioning some conditions upon whom it's obligatory to perform these five daily prayers. So he said the first of those conditions is that the person is a Muslim. The second of those conditions is that the person has to be aqil. The person has to have their mental faculties about them. Because without their mental faculties, if the person, for example, has a loss of consciousness, due to sickness or something or something else of that nature, may Allah protect us and give us good health, then this person, he's not going to be able to make an intention. So because the person cannot make an intention, they don't have their mental faculties about them, uh, then they are not able to pray, therefore prayer is not obligatory upon them in that state. However, when their mental faculties return to them, then they have to make up all of the prayers like the person who was asleep. When a person has overslept his prayer, he has to make up the prayer immediately. Likewise, the person who has lost their mental faculty. So the second condition, the first was being a Muslim. The second was being aqil, that you have your mental faculties about you. And the third of them is that the person is baligh. This word baligh, it means that the person has reached a state now where acts of worship have now become incumbent upon them. They are going to be taken to account for having to do these acts of worship or having left off these acts of worship. So the word baligh, related to the word balugh, literally means having reached an age whereby now you are responsible and take into account that you should do certain acts of worship and you will be responsible for not doing them. Another way of looking at it is that the person has reached the age of puberty. So 
a person reaches, a person becomes balik uh, with four matters, one of four matters. The first of them we can say is that the person uh, notices that they have pubic hair. If the person has pubic hair, they notice that they have pubic hair, then they have now become balik. They now have to respond to all of the obligations that Islam has put upon them. A second way is that the person reaches the age of 15. Another way is that the person has a wet dream. This is the third one. And the fourth way, which is specific to the females, is that um, she will experience menstruation, her monthly cycle. So either, of, either one of these four matters will cause a person to have become baligh. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad and Imam Abi Dawood, Rufi al-Qalam an thalath that the pen of responsibility, the pen which writes down your deeds in your books of deeds for which you are responsible has been lifted from three, meaning that three types of people, the pen is not going to write against them. They're not responsible. And in Naim, the first one, and in Naim hatta yastaykhid. It's been lifted from the one who is asleep until the person gets up again. So in the state of sleeping, the person is not responsible uh, until they wake up. And from the one who is small in age until he reaches the age of puberty. And from the one who has lost his faculties, his mental faculties, he's become crazy until he regains his mental faculties. So the hadith is showing us that uh, it's a proof that what the author mentioned, baligh, that the person has to be baligh, that the person has to reach the age of puberty, okay, for the person to have the salah obligatory upon them. However, children who are less than the age of, let's say, 15 or 14 or 13, the age of puberty, they shouldn't be left alone to not become accustomed to the prayer. Rather. They should be shown from an early age, from the age of seven or so, even earlier maybe, that the Islam, that the Salah is something which is very important to the household. And that every time they pray with the family, with the father, with the mother, they're going to be rewarded immensely. And it's something which the parents love so much to see them do. We want to try to instill the seeds of faith, the seeds of the love for prayer in the hearts of the children from an early age. So many times we have these complaints of parents saying that they have issues with their children. Their children are not, not, are not praying, their children are not obeying them, their children are not being how they're supposed to be. Well, that's obvious because you didn't spend time planting the seeds. If you don't teach the kids from an early age the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then don't expect them to give you your, your rights because they don't know how to give Allah his rights. So from an early age, we want to plant the seeds in the hearts of the young children that they should love the salah, that they should want to pray with the parents, that they should be rewarded in many beautiful ways for praying and it should be uh, it should be kind of made as something really special even maybe you can give prizes to the children do little parties that if they pray for a whole week they get a special party they get a special gift we really have to make the effort to instill the love of the salah in their hearts the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to us in the hadith which is collected by imam ahmad and imam abi dawood muru abna'akum bi salah the Prophet ﷺ said, Command your children to pray the prayer when they are seven years old. Meaning, start to really encourage them to pray. And lightly discipline them. You can physically discipline them just by a little poke or something. If they reach the age of 10 and they have not yet started to pray. And when they reach the age of 10, they'll separate between them in the beds, the Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith. So the hadith is encouraging us that the children, they should start to pray as early as possible, but it's not obligatory upon them until the rate they reach the age of puberty. Okay. One extra point to mention here for those of you that may have studied fiqh before. So you're going to notice that from times, I'm just going to keep it very simple and stick to what the author is trying to explain. And at times I'll, I'll go a bit above that and give you extra points of information for those of you that have studied a bit of fiqh before. So one mas'ala, a mas'ala means uh, something which is often asked about or a matter which is looked into in fiqh. One of the mas'alas that the ulama, ulama, the scholars they mention here is that if a child prays the fard salah with the people, for example, he prays with his family or he prays in the masjid, he prays the fard salah. 
But then after having prayed that Fard Salah, let's say for example Dhuhr, be timed before the time for Asr comes, the person has now reached the age of puberty. So between the time of Dhuhr to Asr, there's four hours maybe. So in the third hour between Dhuhr and Asr, the child reaches the age of puberty. Now that child, the Dhuhr that he prayed, he has to repeat. Why? Because the first Dhuhr that he prayed, whilst he was still under the age of puberty, was for him and Nafil. Was for him an optional prayer. It wasn't an obligatory prayer. But now that he's reached the age of puberty three hours later, okay, it now becomes obligatory upon him to pray that prayer as an obligatory prayer. So he has to repeat the prayer. The author, he says, after mentioning who the prayer is obligatory upon, that is obligatory and upon any Muslim that has, the, uh, that has the mental faculties upon them and that has reached the age of puberty, he says, إِلَّا الْحَائِدْ وَالنُفَسَاء Except it's not obligatory upon the menstruating woman, the woman who ex is experiencing her monthly cycle, or upon the one who is uh, experiencing uh, nifas, the one who is experiencing postnatal bleeding. So these two, it's not obligatory upon them to pray whilst they are experiencing the blood of the menstrual cycle or the postnatal bleeding. The proof of this is in the hadith collected by Imam Muslim, and we know that the um, Imam Muslim is one of the most authentic books of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So Imam Muslim, he collects a hadith from Mu'adha al adawiya who said, this companion, this female companion, she said that I asked our mother, meaning the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiyallahu anha. She said, Sa'altu Aisha. Faqultu, ma balu al-ha'id taqti salah? Ma balu al-ha'id taqti salam wa la taqti salah? She said, I asked Aisha, why is the situation that the menstruating woman, she has to make up the fast that she missed in Ramadan, but she doesn't make up the prayers? So Aisha radiyallahu anha in the hadith, she said, كَانَ يُصِيبُنُ ذَلِكْ فَنُؤْمَرُ بِقَضَاءِ الصَّوْمْ وَلَا نُؤْمَرُ بِقَضَاءِ الصَّلَاةِ She said, that used to happen to us in the time of the Prophet sallallahu that we would menstruate. So we were commanded that we would have to make up the fast that we missed from Ramadan, but we were not commanded to make up the prayers that we missed. So from this hadith and from other hadith and evidences, it clearly shows that the woman that is menstruating, she doesn't have to pray. She doesn't have to pray whilst she is menstruating. Um, some further masail, some further issues which are important to know for the menstruating woman. If a woman was pure long enough for her to have prayed a particular prayer like the Dhuhr, let's say, okay, or Maghrib or any prayer, but she was careless, she didn't pray that prayer and she waited right towards the end of the time of that prayer. But before she could get to start the prayer, her, mens her menstruation started. So this woman, she has to make up that prayer later on. Okay, when she becomes pure, she has to make up that prayer later on. Why? Because she had enough time to pray the prayer, but she was careless and she was lazy. She didn't rush to perform the prayer. And this is an etiquette that we should always have as believers, both male and female, that if, it's, if we are able to, we should perform the prayer in the earlier times. طيب, another point pertaining to this issue of the menstruating woman and prayer is if that the woman who is menstruating, if she becomes pure, if she has the ghusl and is finished from the menstruation at the time of Asr, then not only does she have to pray the Asr Salah, she also has to pray the Dhuhr Salah which came before the Asr Salah. Why? because Dhuhr and Asr are from those prayers which can be joined together. And the third point to mention is that if a woman has finished her menstruation cycle, her bleeding has stopped and she had enough time, um, she had enough time to make ghusl and enough time left to pray one rakah, but she didn't do so, then that prayer has to be made up. So say for example, in the time of Maghrib, she becomes pure from her blood and she has a ghusl, she has a ritual bath, and then she has enough time to pray one rakah from that prayer, but she was lazy to do so, and then the time of the prayer finished. In this situation, she has to make up that prayer that she didn't pray. The author, he says, an important point, he says, فَمَنْ جَهَدَ وُجُوبَهَا لِجَهْلِهِ أُرِفَ ذَلِكَ Whoever denies the obligation of the prayer due to his ignorance, 
then that person is taught about the prayer. So if somebody is living far away from the Muslims, or if somebody is a new Muslim, they didn't have access to Islamic knowledge early on in their Islam, then this person is excused for having believed that maybe the five daily prayers were not obligatory upon them for whatever reason. Okay? The author then says, And if the person refuses to accept the obligation of the prayer out of stubbornness, then this person falls into disbelief. So this person, he is a Muslim, he had access to Islamic knowledge, meaning he lived amongst Muslims in a Muslim land, and maybe was in a Muslim family. So this person out of stubbornness refuses to pray, says the prayer is not obligatory upon me. So this person now will fall into disbelief. Of course, when a person is ruled as having fallen into disbelief, there's a whole process that needs to be gone through before that person is given the terminology of having left Islam. It's not something which is easy and it's not something which unqualified people can delve into. So the point is the author is saying that if somebody denies the obligation of Islam out of stubbornness, as of Inadan, which is a type of disbelief, uh, then this person falls into disbelief. That is because he's denying something which is known uh, by necessity, known in the religion by, by necessity. Uh, the person, another person who leaves prayer due to laziness, okay, totally doesn't pray out of laziness. Say for example, he's just careless. This person can also fall into disbelief. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith which were collected by Imam Tirmidhi and Imam Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Ahad alladhi baynana wa baynahuma salah, faman tarakaha faqad kafar. The Prophet ﷺ said that the difference between us and the non Muslims is the prayer. One of the major differences between us and the non Muslim is the prayer. So one, the one that has left off the prayer, he falls into major disbelief. And also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith collected by Imam Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said rajul wa shirk wal kufr tarku salah, That between a man and falling into shirk, for it, falling into polytheism or kufr or disbelief is the leaving off of the prayer. And one more narration to mention to you guys that Imam Tirmidhi, he collected the statement of the famous Tabi'i. A Tabi'i is from is a person who was a student of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ had companions, Sahaba, and the Sahaba, they had students which were known as the Tabi'een. So this Tabi'i, known as Shaqiq ibn Abdullah, as mentioned by Imam Tirmidhi, who was from the leading of the Tabi'een, the leading scholars of that generation, he said, مَا كَانَ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَرَوْنَ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ تَرْكُهُ كُفْر غَيْرُ صَلَى the Prophet Sallallahu companions, they wouldn't see anything from the actions leaving it off to be disbelief other than the prayer. Meaning that if you left off the prayer, then they would consider you to be a non-Muslim. So it's extremely important for the Muslims to understand these ahadith, to ponder upon them, because it shows the nature of how important the prayer is. And it's not for us, for me and you, for us simpletons, to make takfir. Takfir is that we excommunicate somebody from Islam. That's not our job, it's not our right. Rather, that is the job of the scholars and the judges. They have to follow a judicial process if they're in an Islamic state under the Islamic government. It's only them, once they've gone through that process, that they can give the ruling of a person having left the fold of Islam due to, due to having uh, left the prayer. But the reason we mention these ahadith and we teach them is so that we can remind ourselves and remind the people of how severe the nature of leaving off the prayer is and how important it is for us as Muslims to stick to the prayer. The author he says, It's not permissible to delay the prayer outside of its fixed times. The Pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, Inna salata kanat ala al kitab That verily the prayer is something which has been obligated upon the believers at fixed stated times throughout the day and the night. In Surah Nisa, verse 103. So the prayer is fixed times and we have to abide by those times. And it's a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing His majesty and His greatness and His authority that no matter where we are in the world, the billions of Muslims, no matter what they're doing, when the call to prayer comes, we have to respond. 
and there's nobody else in the universe that owns that type of majesty that when the call to prayer is made that they respond to that call other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim narrated by Qatada, Abu Qatada may Allah have mercy upon him where he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said um, verily in sleeping over a prayer there is no carelessness this means that if you didn't intend to sleep over the prayer that you're not habitually a person that sleeps over the prayer it just happened to be that you overslept so the prophet ﷺ said that verily in a person doing this there is not carelessness or, or being lazy verily carelessness and not caring is the person who doesn't pray a prayer until the other prayer's time has come. So the person just chilled out, he couldn't care less to pray. He wasn't uh, looking at the clock, he wasn't checking his time. He was just very careless and didn't find that the prayer was important. So here the Prophet is saying that this person is somebody that hasn't taken care. So all of what I've mentioned and what the Imam has mentioned is to show that the prayer is important to be prayed in its fixed times and is not permissible for us to delay the prayer beyond those times. So I'll stop here and I'll give you 10 minutes for any questions that you may have or any clarifications and we'll continue from where we left off. And as a reminder that you don't have to ask the questions now, you can go back and look at your notes, you can try to absorb the information that you've taken by looking at the recordings once they're available and you can send any questions to the admin where I'll reward them and they will get them to me and I will try to answer them to you as soon as possible. But please try to ensure that the questions are pertaining to the topics at hand, the topics that we are studying. I'm not a sheikh that can give fatwa. This is something we have to get away from. Too many people in our day and age, they give fatwa, they give verdicts, or they ask about verdicts and they are not from the people who are allowed, who have been fully trained, who have the experience to give fatwa. Yes, I can guide you to certain matters, but a specific fatwa for you, a specific verdict, I cannot give you. There is a difference between education, what we're doing is studying, in this I can help you, but outside of studying, when you want particular rulings for yourself and your life and your family, this has to be taken from scholars who have lived Islam at a high level of knowledge and have the experience of giving fatwa. I thought that was an important point to mention, inshallah. So Jazakumullah khair, if there was anything which was correct, this was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's any shortcomings and mistakes, then this was from myself and Shaytan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us immensely for this small act that we have done and to make it heavy on our scale of good deeds on the day of judgment and to give us the blessings of it in this world also. If you have any questions, then you may either type them up or you may ask. Also, anyway, the first question was regards to if we sleep over prayer time, constantly what is the situation the situation is that you need to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you need to make repentance to Allah azza wa jal and you need to beg him subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you to ensure that you pray on time you need to establish different alarm clocks throughout the house you need to make sure that you sleep early sacrifice all of your activities that you're doing which are you keeping you up late at night so that you can fulfill your acts of worship like Fajr, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not fall under the category of those that are likely to receive a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever it takes for you to be able to wake up for the prayers, do it. Whether it's you ask your friends to come and knock on your door, you ask your friends to call you, you set up a variety of alarms, etc. You train your cat to jump on your head at a particular time, if that's possible to do. All of this must be done. The second question, a person was born a Muslim uh, but never practice until recent years. Do I need to make up for all the salahs missed? Um, it adds to around 10 years. It's a very difficult question, um, but as soon as you came to know that the prayer was obligatory upon you, from that time in your life, that's when you had to pray. So any prayers from that time in your Islamic life, that, those are the prayers you would have to make them up, even if it meant that that was like eight years worth of prayers that you need to make up. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you and to give you ease and to make your matter easy. What is the best advice to get khushu? The best advice to get khushu in the prayers is to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for khushu. To beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tranquility in the prayer. To beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enjoyment in the prayer. To learn the du'as which pertain to the heart. Allah man yasaluka al man wa qalban khashi'a. Our Allah asks you for beneficial knowledge and for a heart that 
has tranquility and trembles at that you'll mention and to learn how to get the khushu by listening to the lectures and the books uh, written on these topics but the first and foremost and the most important is to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to turn away from sins as much as possible because sins they get in between us and having a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how foolish we are for falling into sins I struggle to wake up for Fajr and feel I have tried everything any advice give charity when you give charity make the intention that you're going to you're giving the charity for Allah to help you to get up for Fajr Continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repent from any sins that you may be doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is full of bounty. He loves to give, He loves to guide, He loves to see us walking towards Jannah. Allah loves for us to do the acts of worship. So for sure, He's going to help us if we continue to beg Him and implore Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it important to pray five times a day? It's important to pray five times a day because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this obligatory upon us. Allah gave us our life, He's given us everything in life. And as a, as a way of showing appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should submit to his commands. And also we want to enter into paradise. And the best of ways to enter into paradise, or one of the crucial deeds that we have to do for entering into paradise is the prayer. So the one who turns away from the prayer after knowing that it's obligatory, then this person is putting himself in jeopardy, jeopardizing his journey to paradise. The person is saying to Allah, I don't really want your paradise. By turning away from the acts of worship, such as the prayer. So it's imperative that the person prays. Yes, Barakallah Feekum. We'll stop now and um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us all and forgive us our shortcomings. And I hope to see you in the future weeks for the prayer, uh, for the prayer course. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.